Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about prednisone. Prednisone is a cortisone-like steroid. It's synthetic. It's an anti-inflammatory glucocorticoid that was patented in 1954, approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1955. And even though it's more than 60 years old, it still ranks in the top 25 prescription medicines here in the United States with 22 million prescriptions written each year. And as a matter of fact, it's on an upward trend and it's almost identical twin prednisolone, well, there are more than 5 million prescriptions written every year for it, and it also is on an upward trend. Now, prednisone is a treatment for almost whatever ails you. It's for endocrine disorders and rheumatic disorders, connective tissue disorders and skin rashes and allergic reactions. It's good for eye disease and respiratory disease and blood-related diseases and cancers and gastrointestinal conditions. And it's used as an anti-inflammatory drug. And in some cases, it actually can counteract edema, even though it may cause edema. So let's take a little closer look at some of the uses of this very important medicine. It's used for skin disease, so anaphylaxis, allergic reactions, angioedema, serum sickness. It's used for exfoliative dermatitis where the skin sloughs off and very severe eczema and contact allergies and insect bites and drug reactions. It's used when your calcium is elevated because you have a metastatic disease to the bone or from sarcoidosis or the calcium can be up because you take too much vitamin D. It's good for connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis and post-traumatic osteoarthritis and acute tenosynovitis when you can't lift your shoulder. It's used for acute gouty arthritis and lupus and vasculitis. It's used for dermatomyositis polymyositis. It's used for thyroid conditions. So it's used when people have a thyroid condition and start developing some fluid around the eye or subacute thyroiditis where a person has fever and thyroid pain and swelling. It's used for a condition known as congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It's used for certain eye diseases so it can decrease the scarring from ocular injuries like shingles or in people with optic neuritis or multiple sclerosis or people who have significant ocular allergies. Although for many cases, topical steroids will do, oftentimes we need to resort to oral prednisone. It's used for neoplastic diseases, for leukemia and for lymphoma, for unresponsive breast cancer and myeloma. It's used for treatment of advanced painful hormone resistant prostate cancer. It's used for liver diseases, non-alcoholic cirrhosis in women to increase their survival and for chronic active hepatitis. It's used in neurologic problems. So it's used for cerebral edema that's associated with either a primary or a metastatic cancer. It's used for brain tumors, brain injury, head injury, craniotomy, multiple sclerosis, as I mentioned before, for the acute exacerbations in myasthenia gravis, and for organ transplantation to prevent rejection in people who have a parasite known as trichinosis. Well, sometimes it gets into either the heart or the brain. For people who have that, prednisone seems to be very good. For nephrotic syndrome, to protect the kidney used for pulmonary disorders, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease when you have an exacerbation or aspiration pneumonia or severe asthma or hypersensitivity pneumonitis or you can get a condition known as sarcoidosis involving the lungs and even people who have fulminating and disseminated tuberculosis well if they're on therapy to kill the organism then sometimes the steroids can be life-saving and for people who have AIDS, they can develop a lung infection with parasite known as pneumocystis juravecki, used to be pneumocystis carinii. Well, it seems to be quite helpful for that as long as people are on the appropriate anti-infective therapy. And it's good for blood disorders like acquired or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Or when your platelets go very low, thrombocytopenia. Or in people who have blood breakdown right in the system. Well, it's also good for decompensated heart failure in some people to increase the renal response to the diuretics you're taking. So overall, 
the use of prednisone is extraordinarily important in medicine. It suppresses the immune system, it decreases inflammation, treats high calcium, treats adrenal insufficiency, along with other kind of steroids. Mechanism of action is relatively simple. It attaches to the surface receptors, gets inside the cell, goes into the nucleus, binds to certain nuclear receptors, and then that involves the genes, and it activates or inactivates certain genes. It also counteracts histamine. It increases the red blood cells in the bone marrow, increases the survival of the red blood cells in the platelets. It reduces the allergy cells, those eosinophils. It promotes the production of glucose, alters the distribution of fat from the periphery of the body to the center part of the body, increases the protein breakdown, it decreases the intestinal absorption and increases the kidney's excretion of calcium, works to prevent some of the immune complexes from blocking up the kidneys, increases cell differentiation, stimulates the cell death in cancer cells, can stimulate fat synthesis and fat storage. It acts to counteract the activity of insulin so that means you tend not to use too much glucose, but the glucose that you do have seems to accumulate in the bloodstream and in the liver. It's anti-emetic, so it can help reduce vomiting. Well, anything that has so many positive effects also has some negative effects. And the negative effects are extraordinarily long. So let's go over some of them. The minor Effects can make you nervous or lead to acne or increase your appetite and that increases your weight, increases hyperactivity, seems to lead to leg pain, leg cramps in some individuals, headaches and stretch marks, leads to indigestion. If you take it too long, it can predispose to cataracts and bone loss, osteoporosis, easy bruising on your arms and legs, can lead to muscle weakness and yeast overgrowing in the throat can lead to increased blood glucose, which leads to diabetes, increases the likelihood that you're going to develop an infection, and also seems to cause some psychiatric reactions, causes agitation and euphoria along with depression and anxiety. Well, the more major complications are steroid atrophy or steroid myopathy, leads to mania, can lead to unusual fatigue and weakness, mental confusion, can lead to attention dysfunction, we call it steroid dementia, lead to blurred vision. And of course, the steroid-induced osteoporosis is a major problem, but it also can lead to avascular necrosis, breakdown of the bone and death of uh, certain areas of the bone, lead to severe joint pain, gastrointestinal perforation that's marked so you don't even realize it relatively early on, so it can get to be a major problem. It can lead to fat deposition in the liver, can lead to an irregular heart rate, can lead to aggression and agitation, unusual thought, shortness of breath. It can lead to irregularity of breathing and numbness and tingling in the arms. It can predispose to infection. So it can unfortunately cause local infections to disseminate. That's a problem if you have latent infections with candida or tuberculosis or pneumocystis or toxoplasmosis or amoeba, even amoeba. And if you've been down south or been to the tropics and you have a roundworm infection, a nematode, that might be totally asymptomatic and typically is totally asymptomatic. Ster, uh, strongyloides stercoralis. Well, that unfortunately can disseminate and that's a major problem and it can mask the signs of infection, so you could have a viral infection, bacterial infection, fungal infection, protozoal infection, and you might not have any symptoms. Well, if you have measles or if you have chickenpox and take steroids, that can lead to major problems. Or if you have amoebiasis, so you've just come back from the tropics or somewhere, you've got to make sure that you don't take steroids. Same thing if you happen to develop cerebral uh, malaria. There's a problem if you're taking the prednisone. You shouldn't receive any live vaccines. That can be a potential problem. But the ACIP, that's the committee that provides 
guidance to the federal government on immunization practices says, well, it's okay if you're on the steroids, but you haven't been on them for terribly long, just less than two weeks, or if you're taking a low to a moderate dose, or you're taking them on alternate days rather than every single day, or you're taking a low dose like a maintenance physiological dose, five or ten milligrams, there's no problem, of course, if you're using the topical steroids or if you have an injection of steroids into a joint have to be careful a little bit about some of the musculoskeletal problems that come along with steroids, especially in high dose, especially for long periods of time, because it causes muscle wasting. Typically, it causes that in the first six months of therapy, delays the wound healing, of course, leads to that osteoporosis we talked about, more in the trabecular bone than the cortical bone, lead to vertebral compression fractures, pathologic fractures of the long bone, not uncommon, especially serious problem in older individuals and geriatric people, postmenopausal women, can lead to tendon rupture of the Achilles tendon especially, especially when you're using high doses for a significant period of time, lead to fluid and electrolyte problems. So we have problem with sodium retention. That can lead to edema and congestive heart failure in people who are predisposed body loses some potassium, you lose calcium because you retain the sodium, can increase your blood pressure. Eye diseases lead to cataracts, specifically the posterior subcapsular and the nuclear cataracts can increase the intraocular pressure and lead to glaucoma and damage to the optic nerve and ruin your vision, can lead to infections inside the eye viral infections, fungal infections. Certainly you should not use prednisone if you happen to have acute herpes simplex of your eye. Can lead to anemia and menstrual abnormalities. It can decrease or increase the sperm motility and number. It can increase the blood sugar and worsen your diabetes. Have to be careful if you've had a heart attack recently because it interferes with the normal healing process and can lead to a likelihood of increase in the rupture of the heart itself. Also lead to high blood pressure and pulmonary edema and thrombophlebitis can lead to arrhythmias and congestive heart failure. Certainly people who are taking steroids have to be a little bit careful, at least as far as their mental state is concerned, because of euphoria and mood swings and personality changes can lead to depression and psychoses, lead to insomnia. Well, there are certain warnings. So if you have diverticulitis, you probably shouldn't take the drug. If you have ulcerative colitis, it might be an appropriate drug. However, if you have impending perforation, if you have toxic mecocolon, this is not the drug for you. If you have abscess or if you have infection in the intestine, again, not the appropriate drug. And it can blunt the signs of peritonitis, and especially in older individuals, can lead to muscle wasting and problems with wound healing. Well, the prednisone that you take actually is going to downregulate the production of the cortisone from your adrenal gland. Under normal circumstances, the hypothalamus in the brain tells the pituitary to release some chemical to tell the adrenal gland to make the appropriate amount of glucocorticoids and the mineralocorticoids, two different kinds of corticoids. Well, when you take the prednisone, it turns the whole system off. And because it turns the whole system off, then your body ultimately, after a period of about seven days or thereabout, starts to develop what's known as adrenal suppression. And the adrenal gland eventually turns itself off so that you're totally dependent if you've been taking the prednisone for a long enough period of time at a high enough dose. The adrenal gland, in effect, as far as the cortisone is concerned, shuts down. So even if you've been taking the steroids for as little as seven to 10 days, you probably ought to taper the drug rather than discontinue it abruptly. So you taper it for a few days if you're on short-term reaction, but if you're on a long-term dose, you might have to taper it over a period of months or even a year or so. Because if you abruptly discontinue the drug, you might lead to a condition that we call an Addisonian crisis. And that obviously can be quite severe. 
So you find that the suppression starts at a dose of about 7 to 10 milligrams after a period of about several weeks. Short term, you can stop abruptly, as I mentioned. Long term, no. If you do that, you're in trouble. So you consider, well, the disease that you're being treated for, the likelihood of relapse of the disease, the duration of the treatment. And you remember that you want to taper relatively slowly. So we start off at whatever dose, and you go down by about two and a half, maybe five milligrams a week, uh, five milligrams a day, every three to six weeks. So maybe about once a month you decrease the dose by just a little bit until you get to around seven and a half milligrams. Then some people say, well, let's switch over to hydrocortisone itself. Let's stop the prednisone, go to hydrocortisone, and then taper that down slowly. Or some people just continue gradually, gradually over a long period of time decreasing the prednisone. Either one is acceptable. If you stop the medicine, then you might have some withdrawal syndromes. And withdrawal syndrome could be some lethargy or some fever or some muscular pain. Also know that you could develop some adrenocortical insufficiency. And that can be a major problem, especially if you have some other kind of event that causes your body to need more steroids. So if you have the stress of drinking too much alcohol or surgery or trauma or have a heart attack or get dehydrated or you overexert yourself or you're exposed to excessive cold for too long a time period or you have a burn, then unfortunately you develop this Addisonian crisis where you don't have enough cortisone because your adrenal gland, even though it might have gotten back to normal after the taper, it's still not back to normal for a period of about 6 to 12 months after you stop a prolonged course of steroids. And then when you have the stress, your potassium can go up, your calcium can go up, your sodium goes down, your blood sugar goes down, your blood pressure goes down, you get dehydrated, you can start to faint. Also, people suffer from nausea and vomiting and confusion and lethargy and delirium and headache and sluggishness and a whole series of other conditions. So you have to treat prednisone with due respect. It's a very important drug. It's a very good drug, but it has to be handled appropriately. You want to take the lowest dose you possibly can. Now, there are some conditions that require high doses, and in those conditions, well, you just have appropriate caution, either on therapy, monitor people, get some tests, and get off it as quick as you can. It was first described in 1950 by Arthur Nobile. It was first commercially synthesized in 1955 by Shearing Corporation. Now it's part of Merck Corporation. And we know that prednisone is a synthetic adrenal steroid. It seems that we need to monitor people who are taking the drug, need to check their electrocardiogram, their blood pressure, get a chest x-ray, check the bone mineral density every six months to a year, the spine, should do a spine x-ray, check the fasting blood sugar and the electrolytes, especially the sodium and the potassium, check a person's weight, check the stool for occult blood loss, in the pediatric population, check the linear growth because the drug can slow growth down. Check a morning cortisol, a fasting cortisol. Pregnancy and breastfeeding seems to be relatively safe. There can be some problems, of course, and the first trimester might lead to some orofacial clefting, uh, cleft lip, cleft palate. The intrauterine growth retardation might occur, decreased birth weight breast milk, it's present at about 5 to 25 percent of the maternal concentration, but the total dose that the child gets, the newborn gets, would only be about a tenth of a percent of what the mother's dose is, can lead to some decrease in growth and interfere with the endogenous production of the child's steroid. That's a potential. Pediatric population. We don't like to use the medicine when it's not appropriate, but when it is appropriate, it's okay. But realize that in the pediatric population, it can blunt the growth and maturation, lead to osteoporosis and fracture. So it's best to give 
children every other day dose rather than every day dose, when you take the prednisone, it's going to require some kind of metabolism. It's going to require metabolism because prednisone itself is inactive. It's got to be converted inside the body through some enzymes into prednisolone. That's the active form that goes and binds to the cell and activates the receptors. GI absorption, peak absorption, if you take it with food, if you take it with some food, it's less likely to cause a gastrointestinal upset. However, it's interesting to note that there's a decrease in absorption if you take it on an empty stomach. The half-life of the medicine is two to four hours. In children, it's only about one to two hours. It's inactivated by those drug metabolizing enzymes we've talked about before, the 3A4. And it seems that medicines that inhibit the production of 3A4 are going to increase the concentration of prednisone in the body. On the other hand, if you take a drug that is going to stimulate or induce that 3A4, then your prednisone is going to be more rapidly metabolized. You won't have as much of it in the body. Well, there are some interactions. So if you take it with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, naproxen, Motrin, even just aspirin, might lead to increased gastrointestinal upset. If you take it with cyclosporin because you have an organ transplant, well, it can increase the concentration of both the prednisone and the cyclosporin. If you're hypothyroid, the concentration is going to build up in the system. Hyperthyroid people are going to have less of the prednisone in the system. It's unpredictable in its response to the oral anticoagulants. If you take a birth control pill, it's going to increase the concentration of prednisone. And if you take a diuretic, it's going to decrease the amount of potassium in the system. And they both are going to do the same thing. Well, you have a natural cycle of production of your own endogenous cortisone. And the cortisone you make is not exactly the same thing as the prednisone that you take. So it seems that the maximal adrenal cortical activity is between about 6 in the morning and noon. The absolute peak is around 8 to 9 o'clock in the morning. And you have a minimal production sometime between about 9 p.m. and 3 a.m., with around midnight being the lowest level of cortisone in your body. Well, how do you take the drug? Some diseases require you take the drug daily, but if you're going to take it on a long-term basis, and if it's appropriate for whatever disease you happen to be taking it for, well, it seems that if you double the dose and take it every other day rather than every day, that's going to reduce the likelihood of the adrenal suppression and it's going to reduce the damage to your muscles. So that's pretty good reason to do the every other day dose. Prednisone comes in a lot of different forms. It comes in a tablet or a solution or a suppository. It comes in a delayed release tablet. And the only difference about the delayed release tablet is you take it now and four hours later it starts to work rather than it starts to work as soon as you take it. You pay a significant price for that four hour delay. It also comes as a nasal spray. It comes intravenously. Individualize the dose. It could be anywhere from one or two or five milligrams. Could be up to 60 or more milligrams. Again, depends on the particular dose. Tend to come off it relatively slowly. That's why most people are aware of the dose pack. It's a different kind of cortisone. But the dose pack where you take seven pills and six pills and five and then four and three and two and one. Well, you can do the same thing with prednisone. You can take, say, six or seven or eight or ten today and then you cut down each subsequent day. That's quite acceptable. The drug is very inexpensive, so you can buy 30 of the 5 milligram tablets for anywhere between about $10 and $30 with the coupon from GoodRx. You get it for less than $10. Now, they do make that delayed release form, and the delayed release form, you can buy 30 of the 5 milligram tablets, not for less than $10, but the list price, the cash price, the cash price, if you go to the pharmacy, is going to be $3,200 per month. And if you have a discount coupon, you can get it for $2,700 per month. Now, it's made by Horizon Pharmaceuticals. They also make another chemical known as Duexis. Duexis combines ibuprofen. You get that without a prescription over at the grocery store. 
and it has a little bit of pepsin thrown in it. Both of those are very inexpensive, but when Horizon Pharmaceuticals puts it together as Duexis, their cash price, if you go to the drugstore, is about $2,900. And with their coupon, it's $2,500. So, that's the story about prednisone. It's as close to a miracle pill as you can get. It has lots of uses in medicine, but it has just as many adverse reactions to it especially if it's used for long periods of time at high doses or if it's used inappropriately. So when you use it appropriately, use it for the shortest period of time possible at the lowest dose possible. And if you do that, then hopefully you'll come through your course of therapy much to the better and you'll escape a lot of the side effects. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new shows. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.